Right, so I'm going to um, power up the machine now. Got the CD in the drive. It's all set to boot from CD. Um, what, like I say, while I'm waiting for the um, memory to be cleared on the ECC RAM, just uh, worth pointing out that if you are installing on 64-bit especially and you want to boot with UEFI, you do need to boot the host Linux system that you're using um, with UEFI, otherwise you won't be able to create your Gen 2 system to boot from UEFI. <clears throat> so there's some information here about booting the minimal CD. Uh, I'm not going to go through it all, but um, what I will do is show you um, what I do, because I need to make some separate changes, but I can take you around it when the screen comes up when the machine starts to boot properly. Um, I have an issue, I don't know if it's to do with the USB ports, but um, I have an issue where the keyboard doesn't work during the boot process, so I can't specify that I've got a UK keyboard, but there's a way around that, so I'll show you that in case you have the same issues. So just booting all the uh, BIOS code and the CD-ROMs being accessed now, so it should be coming up soon. So there's the boot. Now, um, you can press tab to see the available kernels. It also says F1, does it? Yeah, you just get the same thing in a different layout. So the default is the Gen 2 kernel. If you find you have problems with that, um, then the Gen 2 with no frame buffer is a good fail-safe. And obviously you won't have the... Um, high resolution um, video display but um, it's a good fail safe. There's also um, Memtest 86 on there for testing your memory. I'd recommend doing that if you've never done it before, if you haven't done it for a while, only for the fact that you'll be doing lots of compiling. Compiling is quite intensive on the hardware, both the CPU and the memory. Having said that, I've found also in the past that Memtest is not capable, or it certainly wasn't at the time. Um, it may be different now if it's more up to date, but certainly I've had issues where um, a system, I've had problems with a system, it's been causing errors while I've been compiling. I've tested it with Memtest 86 and it's passed flying colours. I'll go back to compile and I'm getting errors again. And you know, when you look up on the internet with these type of errors, it suggests that there's their memory errors. And certainly in two situations, now two separate occasions, um, I've found this has happened. I've swapped out the memory and everything's been fine. So yes, Memtest in the past has been good. Like I say, it may still be the same, but don't treat it as being gospel um, that it says, you know, if it fails, if, if it passes, that um, it means that everything's all okay. You can only say that there's a good chance that everything's okay, not that absolutely everything's okay with with your memory subsystem. Um, if you do still get problems when you're compiling, then you've got to start assuming that it's a problem with the memory. You're going to have to look at swapping modules out to identify um, if you've got a faulty module. So anyway, um, I'll be using Gen 2 kernel. Um, as it says at the top here, you can press F2 for other options and it'll read them off the disk and display a help screen. It tells you here a bit more about other screens you can view. And basically it's the stuff that's in the handbook is also online on this disk. So there's all these extra options you can add in. If you have problems with the hardware or you want to enable or disable stuff, um, that's what that's all there for. So one of these options, if I find it, is the one that I'm gonna use um, yeah, now I can't find it. Let's have a look again. Okay, it's not actually here, funnily enough, but it does work. Oh, right, okay. It's an adaptation of this. Basically, anything beginning with no means that that option is disabled. So there's an option called key map. No key map um, disables the, as it says here, disables the key map selection used to select non US. So this is the problem I have during the boot of the minimal CD. 
and it's only on this system I have it, or well, I have had it, um, you get a menu coming up where you can select the keyboard layout um, for non-US keyboard users. And at that point, the USB is not working. So either it is a problem with the motherboard, as I say, it's a little bit buggy, or it's the fact that USB has not been initialized, or maybe the you know, there's a problem with legacy USB. I don't know what it is, but this is a way around it that you can use this option key map and specify the key map you want to load. So to do that, I have to specify the kernel that I want to load. So it's Gen 2. And then I just type in key map equals, and I want a UK keyboard. So obviously if you want a example, German keyboard, it would be DE and so on. And that's that's all I need to do. So I press enter there. It loads the kernel and starts the boot process. And there you go. So you can see it's got two cores, or sorry, not two cores, two separate processors. There's two little penguins come up there, two tuxes. And it's, a re it's about this time that the key map menu comes up. See, it says it's loading the UK key map, so it's recognized that option that I've put in there. So it's around that time where it puts the menu up. Um, if you don't put that in, um, I, I do know for a fact that if I use a wired keyboard, because this is a wireless keyboard with a USB dongle, um, I don't get that issue. So I, I do know it's something to do with this USB. So I'll just wait for this to finish loading. So it just confirms that we're booting into a 32-bit i686 version of Gen 2 Linux. And also the network, if you've got it all plugged in and everything, it should be detected and configure itself um, using DHCP. Um, but that's one thing we'll check. So you can see it's found the mouse there. And GPM has been started, so if I move the mouse, yeah, there's the GPM cursor. So that shows that that's all activated. So you can see it's found both CPUs, so that's that's another good thing, because that shows that SMP is enabled. So if you do boot on a multiprocessor or, say, a hyper-threaded uh, box that um, it's all activated, you're going to get the most out of your, your machine. Some of these other messages give little hints which are worth bearing in mind because um, they'll be useful when we create the kernel. Uh, this one here says not loading APM BIOS support. So, uh, um, and also it says ACPI power management function is enabled. So this board was manufactured around the time that APM was being dropped in favor of ACPI uh, power management. So that's worth knowing that in the kernel, um, I won't be in enabling the older advanced power management support but I will be enabling ACPI and you can see that it's uh, looking for DHCP it's giving me hints as to the sound card if that's important to you if you're gonna uh, create a system where sound is important and also it's giving me the name of the graphics card as well so these are all sorts of things you might want to make a note of for configuring the kernel and then we get this message saying you know, welcome to Linux and so on and it gives us the address of the handbook um, yeah, sorry, it tells us how to set up the Ethernet if you want to specify it all by hand, all the network settings. Gives the link to the handbook and how to access it from the command line here. So I could copy that if I use the PCs and copy that. Paste it in with a center click 
and press enter and as you can see we've got internet access on a text browser so you can actually do the configuration from there and if I can I log out again yeah if you do log out control D you'll it'll just log you back in again but it gives you the welcome message uh, the only reason I did that is to point out that this bit here which is what I'll be doing you can start a, an SSH server on here so that you can access the setup uh, remotely this this host remotely and also remembering to set up a password for the root because it's um, unknown currently so if I go back to the handbook where we're reading it all this information like I say is in the handbook that we've just seen it may even give you some more information possibly um, yeah it tells you about other if there's other hardware you need uh, enabling to you can use mod pro to enable that hardware for example if uh, networking's not come up you may need to install the module man manually and then get um, get the uh, network going that way um, it mentions about changing the root password here we will do that because we'll need that for accessing remotely so I'm just gonna type this in I won't be able to copy and paste this at the moment because this is a glass terminal that we're looking at here so there's no I can't right click and paste into there so I'll just type in password root and I'll set a password oh yeah, that's something new it's even suggesting passwords which is quite nice um, it looks like it's not going to let me use the cheap and weak password that I normally use so I bet if I try it again yeah it's rejected it it's being too short so I'm going to try it again yeah it's too weak okay too short um, yeah <laughs> I suppose it's good in a way it's not handy for me for just doing a demonstration but it's good in a way to there's these warnings um, to make sure that you, you do actually create a, a decent password um, so let's um, no it is quite good isn't it um, Right, it's taken that one. Right now, I'd better make a note of that because I'll guarantee to forget it. Right. Okay. So let's um, go back to the handbook. So the next bit is about adding a an ordinary user. It's probably not worth doing that because um, most of what we need to do to set up the Gen 2 system, we need to be root. Um, and there's, although there's a few commands, there's not a great deal. Um, so I, I think it's a little bit pointless. It's probably worth doing that if if you have to like if the system's being used by other people maybe in um, yeah yeah I, I can't really actually think of a really good reason why you might want to do that I mean they even suggest it goes straight I oh know straight to that user um, yes I suppose as the ordinary user could be viewing the web but like I said really most of this is you need to be the root so um, 
that's probably a little bit pointless um, so okay the next bit is about getting the SSH daemon going um, so we'll do that and then we can do everything else from the uh, graphical environment on on the more modern machine so let's go back to the computer so I need to type in RC service SHD start RC service SSHD start so this will start the SSHD server and you see it says starting the SSHD so that Yeah, so there's a bit here, and I've got a whole chapter about configuring the network in case it's not working. So if I do IP, oops, IPA, you can see um, I've got three network cards. One is the built-in network card. This one here is built into the motherboard, but it's only 100 megabits per second. So I've got a, another card with two network adapters on it. So that's one of the ones I'm using. And you can see it's got an IP address allocated to it, so I should be able to um, ping my name server, for example. Okay, so maybe DNS is not working, that's not a problem. Let's ping the gateway. Yeah, that's working. So I've definitely got network access, so I should be able to um, get in remotely to this machine now. But if you are having problems or you do need to configure the network anymore there's a whole chapter there about configuring it um, DHCP wireless even as well if you wish to use that here an explanation of how networking works